no longer a slave to you, to your labels and definitions. No more a slave. My relationships confuse you. Let it be. I am neither confused nor ill. I no, no longer find recluse in your colors. I am colorful enough in my own brown skin. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Mubina Qureshi from Seva AIFW, South Asian, uh, Asian Indian uh, Family Wellness. South Asian Queer League Shakal is a part of this organization. On behalf of Seva and Shakal, I welcome you all. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box, exchange your views and comments with other attendees. Also feel free to drop your questions in Q&A box. If you have a question for someone in particular, just please mention their name. We have fabulous panelists here and they will answer your questions. My co-host, my Aziz friend, Ahmed Kass Munhazam is here with us. Kass is a queer Muslim immigrant born and raised in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Cass made Minnesota their second home where they received their PhD in political science. Cass is assistant professor of global studies at the Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Cass is going to introduce other panelists and now over to you, Cass. Thank you so much, Mavina Um It's a pleasure to see all of the beautiful faces on a Friday afternoon and so dolled up and so colorful. <laughs> and um, So um, my name is Ahmad Qais Manhazam. I go by Qais. My pronouns are they, them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our amazing, fierce panelists, starting with um, Dr. Devanuj Dasgupta, um, who is assistant professor of um, geography and women gender sexuality studies at the University of Connecticut, and a, and a great, great um, uh, activist and ally to many, many communities, and also a great mentor to many people, queer and trans people in academia. And I'm a great big fan of uh, their work. Um, and then also we have Meda Fast Nagar, who's a dear uh, friend of mine and also my little sister <laughs> by choice, um, who is an essayist and also a poet um, from uh, Minneapolis, um, but they also um, call Lucknow and Minneapolis their home. Um, then we also have uh, Anaita Sa Sarabhai. Did I pronounce it correctly? Sarabhai, yeah. <laughs> Sarabhai. Um, who is a performing uh, performing artist and also a facilitator, educator, and activist based in India, in Ahmedabad, right? Mm -hmm. I'm correct. And then we have also beautiful and dashing Feroza Saeed, <laughs> or Sayed. Uh, Feroza Sayed is um, a very um, amazing and um, I would say brave um, trans uh, activist from based in Philadelphia who has given so much visibility and voice to the South Asian queer and trans community. They're always there to support and always there to um, welcome the community through her love, through her live videos. And I've seen them uh, standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter from day one. Um, cooking and working on the streets with them and giving them love, um, which I have a lot of respect for their um, uh, fierceness, but they are also um, working in Atlanta as um, a, um, a broker. So I think that was all. So I just muted all participants except the host. You could probably unmute yourself because there is, yeah. So just unmute yourselves, the participants. So Kes, you should unmute yourself. Okay, so Devanush muted me. Now I'm unmuted, so I have my voice back. <laughs> so 
Thank you for all for being here. This is an amazing time to talk about decolonizing love. For us, uh, with the forces of violence around us, with all kinds and multiple ways that um, we in society as queer and trans people face um, um, homophobia, transphobia, um, biphobia, and also queerphobia, um, on top of it, racism, how do we navigate uh, with love? How do we um, make this relationship with love? Whether it's self-love, whether it is with our kinship, with our family, siblings, or with the community. And the concept of love is um, so um, central to the work of queer and trans people because um, we all have been in some ways rejected from love, whether it's through our families, whether it's through community or states. And therefore, um, we taught that decolonizing love is um, a moment that allows all of us to think through those uh, colonial forces, through those uh, invading forces and, and, and the power of empire that has created whether it's uh, heteronormativity or whether it's um, monogamy or whether it's, whether it's individualism that oftentimes pull and push us in and out of love. So within this um, uh, gathering, we're here to uh, hear from amazing scholars, artists, and activists in what ways they define love, how in their personal life they see um, love and engage with love, whether it is through relationships with their mothers, with their fathers, with their uh, siblings or lovers, or in what ways we um, can possibly decolonize love, which is an impossibility in itself, because um, whenever I think about it, I always feel like I'm so colonized in so many ways that how can I find even myself? How can I find my home? And then to allow me to love myself. So I think even the conversation is itself is a starting point for that. Um, so with that, I was just gonna um, give um, an, a, a quick uh, format of how it's gonna happen. So each one of uh, the uh, panelists um, will take um, five, eight minutes to share their um, creative writing or, or talk about the, the concept of love and how they decolonize it. And then after each one share their either poem, essay or whatever artwork they have, then we move on and, and engage with the larger questions about the possibility and impossibility of love. In what ways, which bodies, which people, which communities um, have been uh, denied love and and or are in the in and out of the possibilities of love so with that um, do you anybody wants to go uh, first or do you want me to start with my reading of a poem any preferences okay so I'm gonna start uh, by reading um, one of my poems that I wrote recently, thinking about love, thinking about acceptance, and also thinking about uh, family and what what that what that means to me, and um, especially coming from um, a place of war, coming from um, multiple rejections, I would say, uh, and 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 the negotiations we make with uh, with love. Uh, whether it's about uh, uh, romantic love or uh, self-love or the family love. So this poem is to my father. We sat across from each other in our garden one summer morning, surrounded by pink, purple, and blue petunias. The smell of earth after the night rain, the sweet perfume of pomegranate flowers danced in the air, like lovers after a long exile. You asked me to dust off the red roses. You asked me to dust off the red roses 
that had survived in our garden years after years, wars after wars, escapes and returns, patiently blooming red roses. Leaning against the mud wall that stood like a memory archive, holding remains of rockets, blood gashed out of my finger. Right when you yelled, be careful with the thorns. Be careful with the thorns. Bef before you took it out, I saw. I saw the pain in your eyes. You couldn't see me bleeding. A drop on my finger. A drop on the rose. I wondered, I wondered at that moment if you could see my heart bleeding and hurting you if you knew I wasn't the son you wish to have. I wondered in that moment if you could smell the blood on my finger or the mask of my haram lover from the night before dancing with my body. Like the smell of earth after the rain, like the sweet perfume of pomegranate flowers. To this day, I still wonder. To this day, I still wonder if the pain in your eyes was for the blood on my finger or for the queer you saw in me. Thank you. And now we're gonna move on. And um, so I'm gonna popcorn it to Devanuj. Thank you. The smell of earth after the rain. Coming from Kolkata, that smell is very familiar to me. Um, although I grew up in the urban center, so there's a lot of dog and human urine that comes with that smell, but um, that is home. I remember when I first moved to Harlem and I remember walking around um, and there was a sharp smell of urine and it made me feel very homesick. Um, so on that note, Oh my Dubai Liri, oh my Pashai Liri, oh Kul Dori Arbu Ke Kul Nai Re, Kul Nai Ki Nar Nai, Nai Ko Dori Ar Pari, Shabhane Chalaiyo Maache, Shabdhane cha laiyo maache, Aamar bhanga tori go, Aakul dori ar bujhi, Kul nai re, Chahe aandhi aai re, Chahe tu faai re, Hame us paar maache, Leke jana re. I'm not a singer but I thought I would start with that. Because this song, the figure of Damaji, reminds me of the figure of the friend. The friend I don't know. I meet on the boat for a fleeting time, but the friend has to take me across the river, whether it's raining or it's stormy waters. And then we part. I thank Damaji. I give him or her what their due is and we go on. So this fleeting time that I have with friends across radical difference, the friend who didn't save my life, the friend who pushed me into the river, the friend who kicked me into the waterfall and said, swim, is perhaps the friend, the best friend. So my life is a string of lovers. You know, I think the last time I lived together with somebody was probably 
2001, 2002, tumultuous time. And since then I have been single or maybe not single. And one wonders, I've often wondered, why am I a failure? Why cannot I score a romantic lover? And then I thought, oh, maybe I'm tainted product, undocumented, HIV positive, not going anywhere in life. I was like lost goods. So nobody wants a lost goods in a romantic love because it's very calculated romantic love. And I forgot how to calculate in life. So lost goods is the story of lost lovers. A string of lovers who came and went, you know, maybe it was the dark bathhouse, maybe it was in between pain and addiction, his penis and his lips all over me. And I don't want to romanticize this string of lovers. When you live in a life of string of lovers, you live with yourself surrounded with friends and you have to create accountability networks. So decolonizing love for me is not going to what many Indians do or what I typically did is to re recite a share or shairi. Hindus love reciting Sher or Shairi and romanticizing Islamic cultures as some form of pure love. In doing that, what we have done is we have rendered Islam juvenile, innocent, childlike, nature, and Hinduism as civilization, rationality, Indian nation moving forward. His touch makes me impure. My friendships make me lost goods. But here in this loss, I'm all about love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ibanuj. give us so much to think. It's, it was, I think, uh, it spoke to so many of us from different uh, positions and it really um, sat on my heart. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're gonna move to Rosa. Hey guys. So um, I'm gonna read to you guys, I'm not a poet or a writer, but I am going to read to you guys my personal coming out story of coming out uh, again about two years ago. I have what is known as passing privilege. And as a trans woman, I used a lot of that to live in a space of anonymity due to the experiences I had, um, sexual assault, violence, um, and other things uh, in youth. So. I used that to live in hiding for a long time. And some of decolonizing love for me has been finding the ability to love myself. And this was my open letter uh, to social media when I was starting that process. And keep in mind that over the last few years, a lot of these things have changed. I'm no longer married, that's growth. So just kind of keep in mind that this is from about two years ago. I am a trans woman. It is hard saying the words. Not because I'm ashamed of who I am, but because I've never felt the need to speak something so personal to me out loud. I liked living in my anonymity. A part of me felt like my womanhood was based on my ability to not be clocked. Being 5'4 and under 130 pounds, most of my adult life helped with that. After, three, after years of quietly living my life, getting married to my amazing husband, building a career and settling in my life, why say something now? This year has felt like it's been an open assault on me. I am Muslim, I'm a woman, I'm a person of color, trans, and a daughter of Indian immigrants. At times I feel as though half of this country voted against me directly, and that this past election was a referendum on me personally. 
I became very depressed and realized that I would only be able to dig myself out of this sunken place by speaking my truth and being confident in me, all of me. In order to reassert myself, my existence and my strength, I have to speak those words out loud and into existence. Many of my friends, clients, associates, and even my own in-laws didn't know. Some will care and some won't. Some will continue to respect me for my intellect, courage, loyalty, and love me for who I am. Others may not. I may lose business, friendships, and relationships by doing this. There are many reasons why I feel the time is now. I have a strong desire to help the LGBTQ community and to increase trans visibility. Visibility is important now more than ever because over 28 trans people died last year in the US alone. The exhaustion of keeping up this charade and the need for my own affirmation have been a driving force for me also. In the past six months, I've started telling people, many people I know have never known anyone trans and likely never would if I didn't say anything. The reactions have been overwhelmingly positive. There uh, are so many amazing, strong LGBTQ friends and activists that have fought openly for years while I've quietly enjoyed the benefits of their struggles. The ability to come out is eased by my sisters who have been fighting for our rights in person and on panels, in the streets, in the clubs, on TV and in magazines. Recently, I've been so inspired by my sisters from the ballroom scene, women working in uh, changing legislation and the recent election of trans politicians. I've never been pro more proud of my community than in the last few years watching as we've rallied together to push back against the hate. And there has been quite a bit of that. There's a certain amount of shame, guilt, and fear that comes along with being passable. You're always aware of what is happening in your community and know that they need you. Yet you feel powerless in your anonymity and struggle with the repercussions of coming back out and are somehow reliving the fear of society rejecting you. After you've come out once, you've already experienced the pain of losing friends, family members, and you feel, dis you've dis you feel you've dishonored your family. You've been stared at, laughed at, spit on, and physically and sexually assaulted. As you contemplate coming out, it's never the right time. There's never enough money to live on if we lose a our jobs, not safe enough, you're too far into the lies, and you find yourself asking what would happen if they didn't accept you again. You always find an excuse. Coming out twice as hard, almost 20 years ago, I transitioned in college just after leaving my parents' home for the first time. Your freshman year of college is so very hard already. I struggled to pass initially, but quickly got the hang of it. Somehow I ended up in marketing, then corporate America, and finally in real estate. I've surpassed my own expectations and those of others in both my business and personal life. Coming out from the shadows at this point in my life has been a difficult decision for me. I've struggled to three to, for three to four years, though the last year has been painful due to the current political climate. That being said, I found that in my life, we consistently have to transition in order to grow. So here we are. Now that you all know, I look forward to growing my relationships with those of you who are ready to speaking with you, helping you answer questions, no matter how silly they may seem, to increase your knowledge, to fight with you and beside you, and to help you love all of the people out there like me. And that was two years ago. And since then, I have been blessed to have such an amazing uh, experience of coming back out a second time. I know that's not the commonplace in our community and I'm privileged in that regard as well. And some of these comments have changed again. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Feroza. That was such a beautiful um, sharing with us. And also I had read this before uh, on the social media because I'm a big fan of your work, <laughs> but it was, um, feels um, so different to hear it from you reading it and, and, and placing that uh, in such an important uh, identities and, and, and uh, that's so complex and many of us have had those experiences but the way you have put it uh, brings all of that together for us to think about so many things that queer um, and particularly also trans women of color are going through in this country and in other places. Um, 
So with that, um, I'm gonna give the floor to Anahita. Do you wanna go next? Hi everyone. Um, thank you guys for sharing both of you. That was lovely. Uh, um, I have to be completely honest. Uh, I think I, I turned 30 this year um, and for most of my life, I have thought about love, but not decolonizing it. Um, I think very early on, coming from a place like Gujarat, coming from a place like Ahmedabad, where I spent basically all of my life apart from five years, um, and that too, you know, relatively late in my life, um, I had to make a choice early on uh, about how I wanted to grow or how I wanted to progress. Um, and the choice I made was through experience and through myself. Uh, versus through becoming what others thought should happen or what others thought was likely to happen or was meant to happen or many of those things. Um, and I think the only way to have survived that was to have completely committed myself to feeling. Um, and that meant loving because that just turned out to be who I was. <laughs> um, and it isn't you know, I went, I went away to college and I went to uh, Sarah Lawrence. Um, and that was the first time I really actually met a queer person like in, in front of me who wasn't me. Um, and I was eight, 19 when that happened. Um, it wasn't till I came back and really, I think, entrenched myself in the kind of activism that I was not at the back of, but had to be at the front of because it did not exist where I was, that I started to have to think about things that I was already doing, but had never articulated. Um, so I chose two very different things uh, to read today. Uh, one to me is very much, you know, I think as you were saying earlier, uh, a big part of this is also the loving of the self. Um, and I think especially for so many of us who are, are making this journey in spaces where we are one of few or one of none, at least, at least when we start. Um, we don't learn that or we're not taught that till, till even later than I think a lot of other people learn. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna read um, is something I wrote about four years ago um, and it's called Queer. Um, queer. My queer self has been mislabeled, mistaken for many things since birth. She has been assumed straight, a way to be the same, perfectly same. My queer body has tried on every size, has grown too far to fit any narrow mind, has been cloaked in lies woven into the very fabric of history of your imaginations for me. My queer tongue has spelt out words incorrectly for myself, for my safety, for your comfort, has been held to not displace your sense of security, your privilege. My queer feet have danced in shoes placed before me that would not fit, could not be my own, have tried to hide the scars of my journey that only begin there, curling upwards in embrace, tracing each story over razor's edge till the million blades of my hair. My queer soul has raged, screaming within the walls of my body, a form inherited at birth. It has longed for escape, banging against the insides. It has torn away at the fiction of my changing realities. My queer heart has been broken, rebuilt, broken, rebuilt endlessly by many hands in the search for a truth I am creating, every day reinventing. My queerness has become and is done <laughs> with you. So that's one. And the reason that I want to read this other one is because it was written last year and time has an interesting 
plays an interesting role, I think, in all of our lives uh, as we grow and become ourselves. Um, and very much has to do with the outside, with, with those I interact with, not so much with what happens within me. And I think um, they play for an interesting conversation with each other. I want you to roll my name in your mouth, checking uncertainly where it fits in the dark curvature of your cheeks, hoping to find places it can begin and places it can end without dissolving into cavities or burning your soft palate. I want you to take your time with it. Try, forget, remember and try some more still unsure of how it got there or how to offer its fleeting design. As you feel with your tongue, its waves, tentative on its edges, speeding along its curves. I want you to struggle with its foreignness. I want your jaw to ache from it, your will to waver with fatigue and frustration at the alien taste of your own mouth. I want it to fill you, burst at the seams, brimming and exhausted before sounds leave you in whispers, grazing the silence. And when you kiss me that first time, my lips will teach yours the dance of it, the shapes and colors of it, the weight and the rhythm of it, until you breathe it back into me like it has always been yours to give. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I know Anahita for last so many years in my hometown, Ahmedabad, and uh, the the you know a story of being vulnerable and strong at the same time and sharing all this is amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Veda. You go next. <clears throat> yeah, everybody has been amazing. Can can you all hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess I have an essay that I wrote kind of that it's kind of about self-love and kind of about decolonizing. Um, and then if that didn't doesn't take too long, then I might read a poem. But we'll see. I move through the world as a daisy dyke. I type it into my online bios. I spew it to the new people I meet. It shines on my skin and in my heart. These two alliterative categorical nouns hold me with love and peace between them in a way that other terms do not. In some ways, I fear holding this term, daisy dyke, as the ultimate essential component of my identity is a way to lie by omission. What about my white father? What about the parts of me the phrase does not imply? I wonder if I'm reducing myself to something too simple. But then again, what is simple about shouting to the world that you're a brown woman and you love women? Nothing is simple about rejecting the white man's world. This world at large does not know what to do with someone who does not desire any man in their bed. This world at large scoffs at the possibility that brown women can unapologetically love only women and be proud. According to this world at large, I should not exist. I choose to occupy the space of a daisy dyke and that never changes no matter where I go. I don't deny myself my place in that metaphysical space, even when it would be simpler if I did. It would be easier to let my white queer friends pretend that we are the same, that their wealth and health was not built on the backs of my ancestors, of my black and brown brothers and sisters' ancestors. It would be easier pretending that queerness is another bout of white people made fake news while surrounded by my drunken mamajis in Mumbai. Easy was never my style. While I occupy my identity differently wherever I go, I do not let anyone forget who I am. I close my eyes and tell my British girlfriend that it's hard not feeling safe holding hands in public. Leers of feral men keep us a foot apart when we walk in the dark. But it's harder that she only cares about the brown blood in my veins if it means I'll make her a curry. There is, however, a lot I don't say. 
I do not say it because my white girlfriend cannot understand the pain of having a partner beg to come with you to India, while in the same breath complaining about the crowds of Cambridge's Market Square. How do you break it to the one you love that the feeling of 10 people walking by in quick succession is nothing like the hot crush of bodies one must weave through in a tight, intimate press of cotton and skin and sweat? The busy streets of Aminabad and Chalk that make me love Lucknow are 100 times busier than Cambridge, England. How do you tell your partner that you cannot bring her home because personal space is so foreign to your part Lucknowy mind that her bubble will pop, pop so hard that she might just pop with it? <laughs> the answer is you never do. I never did. I broke up with her and cried loud and hard on my Iowan grandmother's couch while grandma pretended not to hear. In white spaces, my desi doesn't come out as me singing and dancing to Gita Dutt classics while drinking too much Adruk Jai, because all that gets me is being told, use headphones, please, and that's not a chai tea latte. And all that gets me is a blank stare with no questions or attempts at connection. In white spaces, my desi dyke comes out and tells people about how the magical industrial revolution in England came at the cost of starvation and mistreatment on the Indian subcontinent. Even as I struggle with unlearning histories of the histories of the subcontinent that my Savarna ancestors, no matter how poor, have been complicit in erasing. In these spaces where I can hold white curry eating liberals accountable, I must hold my Desi Dyke self and my privilege as a light-skinned part white Savarna accountable as well. Nevertheless, like with my girlfriend, I pick my battles. If the white I'm with is my conservative Iowan grandmother, my role as a Daisy Dyke is to curl up in my parents' arms and cry over my breakup, hoping grandma will ask what's wrong. She never does. Lesbianism is not within her comfort zone. Externally, Daisy spaces manifest me, Medha, the Daisy Dyke, very differently. These spaces, no matter how unique, always find me introducing myself with the correct pronunciation of my name, singing the soundtrack of Jewel Teeth with a grin, and grinning to prove to everyone that I can make better chai than my ma. The home I feel when everyone calls me by the name I call myself is enough to offset the pang of unease when my nani teasingly asks me if she should find me a rishta, a nice boy. Sometimes the explanations involved with telling people how much I would love it if they found me a nice daisy girl just aren't worth my time. Sometimes it hurts more to explain who you are than to allow others to assume they already know. I know who I am, and sometimes that has to be enough. With my nani though, it is not enough. The way my nani knows me is more entangled and intimate than my father's mother could dream of. This is why, while I let grandma ignore the dyke elephant in the room, I wrap my arms around my tiny nani and say, find me a desi larki, please. And I'm shocked that she does not ignore me or pretend to let my words slide. It is hard for her to comprehend, to understand, but she doesn't give up and go cold like grandma did when she found out. No, Nani looks at me intently and replies, so have you found the lurky you like? That is when I realized for the first time that yes, it can hurt more to explain who you are than to allow others to assume they already know, but what hurts the most is when others don't even care to ask. So sure, Walking around Lucknow, I don't feel compelled to bust out any dykish merch, but I'm not hiding the dyke. Not with my nani and not with my black jeans and big loose kurta, rocking it like I'm Munna Bhai's best friend circuit. <laughs> not with muskan tattooed on my bicep in Hindi and Urdu. I may leave the aunties alone, but not when I was, but not when I was questioned by some of my lower middle class mamajis after they'd had three too many beers each about fiction about the fictional nature of homosexuality. Beta, do you believe in the gays? I, I mean, I said, of course I do. I mean, of course their jaws dropped. And of course the questions they asked next were nowhere within the bounds of a, acceptable to ask anyone 16 year old Banji. But even so I wanted them to know. I wanted them thinking about the fact that someone with their blood lives in the world happily lesbian. I wanted to erase the distance, the us versus them. I like to think it did some work. Five years have passed, and I guess I cannot say for sure, but all but one of those Amajis is dead now.
I'm only truly at home, spread eagled in the soil. A half-eaten apple in my left hand, sprawled near my sister, Aru. We do not share blood, but somewhere around the age of two, we wound ourselves together as sisters. We have never let go. Two gacy kids stumbling through. With my sister, I am totally free to just be. No explanations, no silent denials. We have weathered the storms of being brown in a white world, of loving women in a man's world, and of treading lightly for our own safety. I go through the world, no matter where, no matter how, as a daisy dyke. It is me when I'm a sister, a friend, a bhanji, a granddaughter, a natin, a girlfriend, a femmes butch. It is me when I'm in Minneapolis, Iowa, Lucknow, Sitapur, Pune, Mumbai, or laying in the dirt. Wow, Meda, that was so, so, so beautiful and powerful. There is <laughs> so much to unpack and process. There's humor, there's uh, these very heavy thoughts and feelings that we all are feeling. Um, and then the, the love with your Nani, and I've seen that, and then the way that it shows and comes in that piece is so powerful. Um, Mobina, do you wanna go next? Um, I started with that small uh, few lines, but I think I'm good. I I really don't need to, yeah feel right now. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like speechless. It's so amazing to hear you all uh, from Afghanistan to Kolkata to Lucknow to Gujarat, Ahmedabad to Minneapolis. It's like I I just took the journey with you all while you were speaking. Mm -hmm. And I felt all those things. Uh, and, and it's just amazing. I'm so happy that you all are here and you're sharing all these wonderful moments of your lives. Yeah, it's, it's also there's so many commonalities in, in this love, although it's the first time we are coming collectively and sharing this work, but we can see the the threads as uh, um, Debanuj was talking about the, the 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 thread of lovers and the strength of lovers. So it's like we can see that strength here of the queer love and brokenness, and also the the failure and the damage that we feel, or or, or uh, like that that uh, coming out and 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 to the community to the love with the with uh, the so-called forbidden love and, and, and our relationship with our grandparents, our fathers, and how we negotiate those. There are so many compli uh, complicated layers that at times becomes a burden, but at times also we carry them with, with so much resilience and resistance. Um, and, 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 and we create these beautiful moments and, 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 and powerful struggles that always uh, becomes a learning moment for others, but also for us in, in this place, I want to engage our thoughts again now, open it to our own um, free thinking of uh, the broken. Because I constantly, when I think about decolonizing love, I think about the, the, the colonization because colonization is a process that has constantly broken not only um, our bodies, but also our soul, our relationship with our families, our relationship with self. And so in what ways we can possibly, uh, as um, Anaita was saying at the beginning that when I think of um, love, I think about like love, not just decolonizing it. When I started as, as a queer person, we think about how to love. And so how can we love despite the brokenness that we carry in ourselves, uh, despite the uh, failures that we feel, the, the damaged good that we are told we are? Uh, and, and how can we be so, it also allows me to think about uh, the recent um, loss of a very, very dear activist, uh, Sara Hejazi, who uh, took her life in Canada in exile. And, and, and that also entangles with the, um, the queer uh, pain 
that we all carry, but also we see that queer love that she left us with of forgiving, forgiving a very cruel word in her last words, uh, a very cruel um, people around us that we always continuously forgive and, 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 and the hurts we get we still come back stronger. So where does that come from? Like, how do we negotiate, or you all have negotiated in your personal lives um, with love, but also with within your own brokenness to also, uh, with our own brokenness to also um, do self-love? If anybody wants to share anything on that. <clears throat> For me, it's been a long, long time uh, and a lot of self-work. So um, I am about to be 40 next year. And I originally came out as a trans woman in college, as I read to you guys earlier. Um, what's crazy to me is the cycle that I've kind of put myself through. So when we talk about decolonizing love, you know, I busted through the patriarchy when I was 18 years old right? And said, I'm a trans woman, and this is what I'm doing, and I'm transitioning. But one of the things that I didn't really realize was how deeply all of this was embedded in me, and how I emulated what I thought and what I saw was a woman, right? And how that fit into my narrative of love, self-love, what a woman represents, what a woman in a relationship represents. So, you know, as I read earlier, I was married, but one of the things that um, has changed over the last two years was I read that in February and I left my partner of 13, 12 years uh, in April, just two months after I read that. But that step of st stepping out, and, and again, I don't expect that all marginalized communities, especially people in um, Desi, South Asian, or, or in our cultures are going to just step out and be out because that's not particularly safe, that's not particularly helpful. But part of my coming out process for me was using my voice again and learning to see myself as whole. And when I did that and, and really loving all of who I am, um, I started realizing where people didn't fit in in the places that I had them previously, if that makes sense. I also really spent a lot of time looking back at what I saw was um, love and how I showed that love. And, you know, looking back at my mom and the intergenerational kind of way that I was raised of, you know, you know, you cook, you clean, you bring home the bacon, you do everything. I mean, I, this is what I saw growing up for my mom and in a very unhappy marriage but ended up staying in the marriage because this is what our culture is. This is what you're supposed to do as an Indian woman. This is what is expected of you. So what was shocking to me was that how I could break out of this patriarchy at 18 and then sit right back into it for another 13 years and do the exact same damn thing I was watching my mom do her whole life. And it was because of the deep rooted culture and colonization and all of this, you know, kind of the systems that are in place that teach us what we're supposed to be and who we're supposed to be and that we're never enough. And I lived in it for a long time. And one of the things that I've learned for me at least is that until you really and truly love yourself and put yourself first, that, you know, all, all of these things are cycles that we're really gonna continue to repeat again and again and again, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks, Firoza. Um, that was so powerful. I was actually going to, I, I resonate with you, you know, I am gender non-conforming, uh, but, you know, I, I, I walk in the world with a lot of cis male privilege as well, you know. Um, but, you know, in my innermost self, you know, when I go to that romantic lover's image and who I, I am, I remember when we were breaking up, I realized, oh my God, I'm desperately trying to mimic my parents' relationship, you know, even in this queer setting, I'm trying to like, just mimic all of that. Um, so questioning that patriarchy. Um, and then in another way I have to question my patriarchy because the other, you know, in, in sort of, you know, when I came out in India in the 90s, 
you know, gay male would sing, you know, that song from the movie Yara Na Tera Jaisa Yaar Kaha Kaha Aisa Afsana Yaad Karegi Dunia Tera Mera Afsana It's a beautiful song, but I have, we have to remember that it was at the expense of the women in their lives, you know. It was at the expense of beautiful Neetu Singh, who just always kept dancing behind Amitav Bachchan in that song, right? Like, so, we, like, you know, there, there's another way homoeroticism for gay men circulates in South Asia that is at the cost of women and cost of the feminine, you know. So I have to kill the feminine in myself to emerge as a legible gay male subject. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about me, I remember when I was really ill in the hospital in 2003, one of my very close friends came and gave me Audre Lorde's collected uh, poems. And um, I remember she read me, you know, I couldn't like lift my left arm because I had a lot of needles and syringes to even eat. And she was feeding me and she read to me, you know, um, Audre Lorde's poem, uh, which is a litany for survival. And in Litany for Survival, she says, when we are loved, we are afraid love will never appear in our lives. When our stomach is full, we are afraid we'll never eat again. You know, and then she says, you know, when we speak, we are afraid we'll never be heard, but we must speak for those of us who were never meant to survive, you know. And I think like in that moment, in that very painful moment, the figure of the friend reading to me, um, Audre Lorde, and realizing what care is in that moment, that there is an accountability. You know, there is this deep history of surviving breast cancer, of the pandemics, you know, be it COVID-19, be it AIDS. We have a deep repository history of self-care and care between queer communities and what accountability between the caregiver and the care receiver is in these moments. Because we don't have, I mean, I, you will realize I'm not going to gay marriage in, in, in everything that I have said, because I think for me, I, I have lived my life in these friendships, in these communities and communes of friends, you know, where we have signed each other as healthcare proxies, you know, because I definitely believe that a marriage is a patriarchal institution. And for me, I don't want me to be part of that institution. My grandmother, I'll finish in with the story. My grandmother, grand aunt, is India's first woman psychoanalyst. And um, I remember interviewing her, you know, um, she was also a freedom fighter. She learned how to, you know, ride horses and she was arrested um, in um, bombing the Alipur uh, court case. And um, I remember interviewing her and she ended up actually uh, separating from her husband because her husband uh, ended up being in a relationship with one of his interns, something about male psychoanalysts and their interns, you know. Um, and I remember that my grandmother um, telling me, and I asked her, I said, where did you get the courage to study psychology and psychoanalysis in pre, uh, pre-independent India, you know? And she said there was, they were carrying the body of a freedom fighter, Binoy Badal uh, uh, Dinesh Bag. Binoy was, he was one of the freedom fighters who was killed by the British and his body was being carried around Kolkata. And she was, I think 17 or 18, uh, from the window, she saw the body being carried and she just started following the procession. And in that moment, she felt like she needed to do something and, and do something for herself, for her country, for freedom. And that moment stays with me. For me, love has a greater purpose. Love that excites me to get out of myself. Love that excites each other to take on a project. I think there's a lot of radical love now on the streets, everywhere with the protests, the caring, you know, uh, I know I see, I see Thirin here, I'll, I'll blast Thirin on the spot, who's also a lovely poet and a singer and uh, an amazing activist and a scholar working with uh, queer Dalit communities and living in a, you know, in a communal sort of system in, in New Delhi and I think, I mean, I'm 47. I think, I think the younger queers show me radical path every day, you know, and I, I will stop there. Thank you. Um, some, something that I think, Feroza, you were saying earlier, um, 
struck a chord with me in a particular way. I think thinking about being um, broken as as something that we are constantly looking at um, and that identity of, of being shattered or being, you know, uh, in, in like a puzzle piece, right? That never fits somehow, you know, it, it that keeps shifting, but never fits in some way. Uh, being a being very much um, underlined with this colonial idea of the self and who we must be. Um, but I think something that I've learned along the way, and you know, you talked about loving yourself as a whole. Um, and I think something I've learned along the way is that the only way for me to do that is to love myself in all its broken parts. Um, and not because it becomes whole, but because it can be whole like that. Mm. And I think that's the difference um, of, of kind of a, trying to attain this completely unattainable um, in, in all our identities. Right? That's the funny thing that nobody can be it. Um, nobody can reach it. That, I mean, that's why it's so ironical. And that's why it's so hard to explain it to people who don't see it because it seems so obvious. Um, and you're just thinking like, but, but you, you know, it's not possible. It's not possible to be that one version of, you know, um, a woman or that one version of a man or that one version of, you know, a wife, whatever it is. Um, so I think that learning for the longest time was very hard for me because I hadn't made that jump yet of, I was still working through, you know, one step forward, five steps back of, oh, this one thing that I've been able to to mold into being less patriarchal, less um, fitting somebody else's idea. But then, oh my God, all these other things that are still in me that are broken. And I'm going back to thinking, then I can't be whole, then I can't love me. I haven't, I haven't become the me I can love yet. Um, and not realizing that yet is that problem or that yet is the, the thing that you know one cannot really uh, attain. So I think that's something very important to say out loud as well uh, for everybody, you know, in the back or even for ourselves because even for ourselves i think it is still a battle every day even though we know that um and that's that's that deep rooted um patriarchy colonial ideas um sense of our own labels and self-enforced issues that we've you know created along the way which are permutations and combinations of all these currently existing oppressing ideas. We, we seem to just keep adding and mixing them so that we can make it more complicated. Um, but something, uh, something else that I think is interesting, you know, as uh, since this is a queer platform, I think it's important to also come through that angle into this is that for me, something that has allowed me to start deconstructing a lot of these ideas and especially, you know, like I said, very recently, the idea of, of colonization and how much of that has informed who I am just because I live in India and you know, good old Brits, right? Like, uh, <laughs> that's just what it is. But um, is that understanding queerness as a political term, as, as more than just a sexual identity in and of itself, but, but understanding queerness in the universe that it is, which is everything from your personal to your political and all the bits in between, um, has actually allowed me to then step back and say, if I can be whole in this and continue working on myself and keep questioning myself without having to tag myself as any one thing to be valid, then I can do that in all parts of my life. Because the one thing I think queerness allows that, you know, I came, came out, I never really came out officially, but you know, whatever version of that was around when I was 11. Um, and it was basically when I first discovered the word lesbian, that, that, that was like, okay, now there's something to say. Otherwise there was no, nothing to say, right? There was no word, there's no understanding. Um, and I stuck to that identity very uh, fiercely because there was nothing else to hold on to. It was the anchor that would legitimize somehow my feeling. Um, and it took me going away to college uh, to learn about queerness. And then it took another four or five years for me to entirely be okay and not, and feel and mourn, but not feel grief for letting the word lesbian go. Um, but to take queerness in as if I was coming home for the first time, um, where I was all of myself and all the specific parts of myself without having to choose. 
um, and queerness allows for that. And I think our identities as those who are left with things, those who have given things uh, between our cultures, between, you know, I think we were talking about the other day, the idea of like, the us and them becomes such a blurry line when you're talking about all of our cultures, because the idea that the, you know, the British left and they took with them all of their stuff left with us, all of ours is a complete nonsense, right? We are a complete mixture on both ends of what happened to each other. Um, and I think separating those parts and understanding them um, can only happen once you have, I think, an idea like queerness that you really embody um, and, and therefore validate yourself during that process instead of kind of having to put yourself out of it, right? And, 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 and put yourself down and say, I'm co constantly failing at it versus thinking I'm constantly achieving it because I'm going through it. I think I have sort of a parallel um, diverging experience to that, um, wherein queer was a term that I used a lot. Um, and now I really don't feel like it applies to me. And I don't necessarily have, I mean, I definitely don't have a problem with other people applying as queer, but as, yes, I'm non-binary. Yes, I'm a lesbian. But like, I want to trouble the idea that lesbian has to be cisgendered. Um, because that isn't me, but the, or like, and the way that I feel using the term dyke for myself, not that like people who are not in the LGBT community should be saying that word, um, in my opinion. Um, but I used, that was sort of a reclamation for me of being like, yeah, this is, it's a little bit more complicated than just like two girls and like, what, what, like, I'm not a girl, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and like feeling um, just very disconnected with sort of the term and also how queerness has sort of become um, accepted and like taken into mean a lot of other things in like, oh, like everything is in academia is like queering this and queering that. And it's like, you're not, that's not what, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, and to sort of take, for me, it was important to take a step back and to, you know, claim this, the term dyke. And, um, and I mean, for me, that was what I needed as also somebody who was dealing with like the colonial ideas about what it means, like femininity and like what it means to be that. And then also claiming the term butch. And although a lot of people might like look at me and have problems with it, it's like, for me, my butchness is how I relate to other lesbians or other other queer people who are into other like dykes or like that sort of space and it's like I'm not gonna let people police how I cut my hair because of it um those sorts of things and now I totally lost my train of thought because I saw something on the floor so I'm gonna stop talking can I, I just wanted to quickly jump in on a couple of questions people have said, but also on this note of like decolonizing. So I think, I think it's very easy to identify the Britishers and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the French as the colonizing agents. Um, they have left, right? And now the demos is within the colon, right? I mean, the whole separation was there was democracy, there was government, and then there was the colon, the colony, right? And now now I am the Demos. When I'm in India, I grew up in India for 23 years, upper caste, stable middle class, looking like majority of the people. And uh, and it is it is I have to question my caste privilege, right? I also think in in the context of South Asia, in my work that I see that uh, sexual difference is not given. There is something to examine as to why the figure of the Koti, the Methi, the Hijra, the transgender has got political imagination and not gay and lesbian. Because what I see in gay and lesbian communities in South Asia is this resintama that transgender has caught political imagination. But I think we are missing something when we don't understand that something about the sex, gender, non-binary, gender diversity was perhaps a way of expressing desire that was non-heteronormative, non, non -heteronormative, 
perhaps gay and lesbian is a, is a colonizing term. You know, it is because gay and lesbian activism, um, as you know, I, I, I can take on us. I was one of the co-founders in Kolkata and it was predominantly middle class gay men, you know, uh, marked by our consumption, what kind of denims we wore, where we met for coffee. And those class caste differences continue. Right. So I think decolonizing, we must think about um, you know, about what is queerness in the context of South Asia, right? We must also think um, that, you know, I think Sian asked me this question about queer. I, I think the word queer in itself is not a problem. And I'll tell you, Sian, why? Because I think, I don't think we live our, uh, our lives in radical um, isolations anymore. Um, you know, because I think there is a lot of exchange of information. The way uh, the middle class gay and lesbian movement started in South Asia was, an ex you know, with exchange with us, the diasporic communities. But I think the terms are taken up and made into something else, just as Anhita and Medha and Feroz are showing us that, we, you know, there is a mediation of these terms that happen. The rainbow flag, when it, people are carrying it in a, in a Calcutta Pride Parade, my, everybody might not have the same connection to Stonewall. They have their own meaning. They remake it to be something else. So I think decolonizing love in this context of queer love for me is to also think of my positions. Like I'm, I'm radically very different. I'm read as a cisgendered gay male professor in the US Academy. And intuitively, my communities, the Koti, Trans, Hijra, Durani communities, know who I am when I land there, right? Um, and the other thing is that I must, must, must name Bollywood for giving me a heteronormative, consumerist version of love and marriage, right? I remember seeing Hamap Ke Hai Kaun and thinking, oh, it would be so nice to have a wedding like this, you know? And even, even progressive movies like Monsoon Wedding, you know, they still celebrate the wedding. And the UNDP commercial about two gay men with the movie stars singing Uthe Sab Ki Kadam, it was also two cisgender gay male having a heteronormative wedding, you know. So I think we must question those. I have talked a lot, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, can I just add one very quickly? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, I think just because you brought up Bollywood, I cannot be ignored, of course. Uh, but I think our it's so much harder to deal with and undo the ideas of love, monogamy, marriage, and caste because of Bollywood. I think it has done the most damage on the masses. Um, than anything else could possibly do. And, you know, even in our groups, as we talk about, I mean, I have people who understand like the concept of, yes, you know, um, marriage is definitely a patriarchal institution, blah, blah, blah. But I really want like, you know, my husband to come in a helicopter and like, I'm like that even in the movie, like that's like barely possible. It's not possible in your life. Like, you know, but this the complete romanticization of this particular upper caste Hindu wedding and everything that is around it is, I think, absolutely. I think it, Bollywood is the answer to why that happened and why it's such a hard thing for all of us to undo in ourselves and in others around us. I agree uh, with both of you. Could you add on? Um, I was just going to say, I agree with both of you guys in that. I just watched the Disclosure yesterday, uh, the TV show Disclosure uh, documentary on Netflix regarding film and uh, TGNC representation in it in uh, America in Hollywood but it had me really sitting back for a while thinking about all the depictions I've seen in Bollywood and growing up with all of that in addition to the depiction that we see for TGNC people here in America and uh, how that's led me to have the misconceptions about my own community that I have and myself and, and sitting back in that and thinking about it has been really interesting for the last 24 hours. To uh, just um, add on that question of queer itself is a colonizing term because it comes from a very Eurocentric place. It's also even the language itself right now we're speaking in English. We all, 
that's none of us is like <laughs> mother tongue or the, the language we grew up on. And so that itself is because also shows the complexities of these processes that we come to that as at the beginning I mentioned that it's an impossible place to, 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 to be to decolonize, but also these are the starting points, but just not to come in defense of Bollywood for me, someone who grew up on the other side of border um, in Afghanistan, Bollywood uh, give me in that sense of queerness in, in a way, despite the fact that yes, now I'm growing as an adult seeing it from a different lens that it's so um, heterosexist, it's so patriarchal in many ways it's also very racist towards Muslims and in what ways it's also problematic in terms of caste and class. But as um, a little boy growing up in the middle of war in Afghanistan, these uh, Bollywood beats and, and the Bollywood divas, Rekha and uh, Sher Devi and, 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 and all these, um, like their own presence on my screen allowed me in some ways to express myself without being uh, questioned and rejected because the first dances I started learning were Bollywood and they were quite queer for me. And, and or, the, or, or, or it also gave me the, my own imagination of love, which was not present in a war zone Afghanistan with um, the only other option we had was Russian movies that were all about war. Um, and, and that also, in, in a way, not to like come in defense of Bollywood, but also to complicate that, that for some of us, Bollywood also give us that imagined queer imagination and queer existences that we always questioned. But we saw that whether it was through um, these, the Bollywood fashion or, or all those high heels and, and saris and the rain and all that. So we all imagine those <laughs> in different ways. Hey, I still want my lover to come in a helicopter and like shower rose on me. You know, I, I do want that some days. But I, I think there's a couple of questions. Do we have time? I think yes, I'm let's take notes. and Hiran has questions. Yes. We, we have time. Yeah, it's just 3.15. So like, uh, th there's so many things I just noted down when you all were speaking and uh, going back to what Anaita said, like, uh, you know, I also had to take up PhD seven years to just, you know, question the Quran, the Muslim upbringing, like I was not allowed to question being a woman, being, you know, in middle class Muslim community. So it, it like taking PhD and, you know, jumping into something very unknown and questioning Islamic feminism, uh, like, you know, and that, that, that was the journey when I would say that the queerness for me was more like questioning and challenging the stereotypes around me, around my mother, around my grandmothers, around all the, you know, women around me in Muslim community there. So, and like chopping off the hair, and you know questioning the beauty and all those things were like big shock i was like always and i'm still outcast and you know you just have to take up all these different ways to adjust and learn and de uh, like unlearn so that that one is there and also about the bollywood like we now we watch all the old movies with different lenses and we just laugh and we just make fun and we just you know do a lot and a lot of critique of all the dialogues and all the representation of a man and a woman and relationships so it is very interesting now when you look at the Bollywood movies now and how you grew up watching as you know Shah Rukh Khan uh, hand in hand you know, singing songs and all those things look so crappy when you have different lands and you grow with, you know, uh, in a very different setting when you question and when you just, you know, challenge all these stereotypical images being even, even you listen a lot of time, like you don't look like a Muslim, you don't behave like a Muslim. So, so that 
all those things, those st stereotypical aspects of your religion, your identity, your uh, feminine or masculine ways of looking and everything that, that, that you, we, we all question every day. And I think uh, this is amazing that we, I could listen to all different perspectives and experiences right here. And I'm seeing a lot of uh, wonderful messages on chat box. And there is a question here in the Q&A box too. So yeah, that, that's for Devnuj. I mean, I mean, maybe Shantali and Hiren can ask the questions. Maybe Shantali, you have some thoughts. I did bring you in, you could unmute yourself and say a few words, uh, both Hiren and Shantali. And, and many of them have questions, but I just saw those directed. You can, you can unmute yourself, Shantali, oh. I think. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, this has been so great. I feel like it's a little like a cheating pleasure because I'm supposed to be working. <laughs> so I feel like y'all are my mistresses. Um, so I, I guess I really, I'm just really excited about this idea of this extended kinship culture. Tara brought it up, Devanush, and I think all of you talked about this. Um, just to situate myself, I, um, you know, I'm in a, I guess, straight, gender non-conforming <laughs> coupledom uh, with my children having queer, um, I guess, godparents. And uh, so I just, but I find that like, it's very hard to build these sort of non-romantic, platonic self-love communities. Uh, I've lived in cooperatives. So I was just wondering if people had thoughts about like how we can create those communities um, cause I guess I want to create that. <laughs> I don't want my kids to grow up, uh, in, and they haven't. I mean, my son, I mean, has been to like salga parties and been, uh, you know, pass around dancing. So I just feel like that is very limited in our culture, but, um, yeah, and I'd be curious what, um, Dara's sort of envisioning of creating these like kind of loving care communities, you know, um, and I'm also 48, 50, so with chronic health conditions, so how do we care for each other? Um, uh, uh, those are all those my kind of concerns. I do think Hiren might have some answer. They have a very interesting uh, everyday experience. Hiren, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, thank you, Devanach, uh, uh, for allowing me to speak. Uh, and, uh, question. I hope I'm audible. Uh, uh, I, I just had a question. I was about wondering because I found the entire conversation very exciting uh, on the question because it was not just about love but about decolonizing love uh, but about who is colonizing whom and what is the history of colonization and even which you brought out very beautifully. Uh, and I also like talked about that the caste class uh, and, and communal lines right now, politically speaking, what, what India is going through as activists are being um, arrested as, 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 as the one way in which you are going to be uh, reprimanded is falling in love across caste, across religion, in either in the name of honor killings or as in the name of love jihad. Uh, that, that probably same-sex desire is much easier uh, compared to uh, just desire itself uh, because uh, or desire itself is framed through caste, class, religion, uh, and not just through whom you're falling in love with. Uh, so I was, I was more curious to think about those lines, uh, and, and more so in the sense because uh, the conversation here is also around diaspora, and how we're trying to then flatten out the diasporic image as, as this uh, person of color, and good person of color without seeing the other openness and fractures that we inhabit and continuously survive through, and negotiate every day, uh, of class, of caste, etc. Uh, last year, I had an opportunity to be in UK for, for a semester as a visiting fellow. And as a, as, a, as a Dalit gay person, having mobility of that kind, going to a UK university was itself a big step. Uh, but there's this one instance that actually um, like it's, it's, it's fascinating for me because when I first landed in Leicester, and Leicester has 35% British Asian population. 
um, and full of diaspora, full of culture, and they have the biggest Diwali celebration outside India. That's what they claim. Uh, and that's what their pride is, mostly good Jews. Uh, uh, and the first time I opened up Grinder there, and it's exciting, because first of all, I open up Grinder, I'm like, on one hand, I'm thinking, oh, as a brown person, will I be exoticized by white people or racialized? And that's what we have been talking about, how, how loving in diaspora is so difficult. But the first message I got in Leicester was a brown person asking me, are you a brown man? And that's where one, one tries to understand that one thing that, that salvations carry anywhere they go is caste. Like whatever diasporic communities one might create, uh, it is fractured on the basis of caste. That you would have uh, in Leicester, Spinning Hill, and which would be Gujarati Muslim community and Gujarati Hindu upper caste people. And that division is what, what defines diaspora, what defines our, our, our possibilities of love. Be there in India or anywhere. And that's why I, what, what I asked the question was, is decolonization even possible without de uh, Because that's how our love is defined. That's how our desire are defined. And I would like to remind ourselves from this, this beautiful love letters that a friend, um, a Dalit genderqueer uh, friend of ours, Dhruva Jyoti, uh, had written and, and it was published in 11 Days of Love by Penguin. And he talks about, they, they talk about just this contestation with, uh, with having desire, but desire by whom? and negotiating that desire, uh, even if it is same-sex desire, through caste, class, religion, etc., etc. Thank you so much. I don't have much to say there, Thiraid. I think you've said it and and I think you, you bring very important questions. So not much to say there, but to listen and, and act and follow your lead. It says, Sujan asks, sometimes do you feel our mothers, our aunts and our sisters support the patriarchy? And uh, definitely, <laughs> uh, 100%. Um, though I've been blessed that my mom was uh, pretty cool in the sense that she told me I was marrying my dad when I first got married. And she was like, you know, you're literally doing what a lot of girls do and you're giving the same kind of, you know, credence to the qualities that you've seen growing up in your, in your father. And I think that this is going to be an unhappy marriage for you. You should be very careful because I'm living in this space. I don't think that's a general experience. My own sister-in-laws uh, who are, two are from uh, India, two are from America, right? So a uh, good mix there but uh, from one of the American ones and one of the Desi ones, uh, the question was asked, you know, what is it that is making you leave him? Does he, did he beat you? Does he, you know, did he cheat on you? Like, like that's the reason in 2020 or 2019 that a woman can leave her husband. Uh, it's not purely based on being unhappy or, um, you know, that I, that I don't have the capability of making those decisions on other things, like those are still factors in why somebody would leave somebody. So yes, I do believe that our mothers, our aunts, our sisters, and everybody else, uh, needless to say, are still part of the patriarchy. And I'd, I'd like to say that even inadvertently at times, probably every single one of us are as well. 100%. Uh, we, yeah, like, <laughs> just because we're having these conversations doesn't mean we don't do problematic stuff. Um, it's even relating to things that directly affect us. Um, and like everybody at some point, probably every day does something that upholds the patriarchy. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this recent Netflix show, the Mindy Kaling show, Never Have I Ever, like, you know, I watch it, it's very problematic, it's sarcastic, but it only goes to a certain point. And then, you know, the, the young girl's desires and, you know, she's outgoing and I'm like, oh, and then the, you know, very sort of gender normative, you know, multiracial boy passing white that she falls in love with me. I'm like, oh my God, there's redemption. They're in love, you know? Or there is a song uh, that Rekha and Vinod Mehra have from this movie, Ghar, that says, 
ये तेरा घर ये मेरा घर हमारी हसरतों का घर इट्स लाइक रेखा इज लाइक फोल्डिंग ओ शी सिंग तेरे भी ना जिया जाए जाए ना आई कैन लिव विदाउट यू एंड शी इज लाइक पुटिंग अवे हर हस्बैंड्स टाइज एंड सूट्स एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट फॉर द लॉन्गेस्ट टाइम आई वुड बी लाइक ओ माय गॉड आई वांट दैट यू नो एंड आई आई डोंट थिंक देयर इज अ प्योर आउटसाइड um to um i i think the struggle i think it's okay to be not okay i think it's it's important to be challenged you know um i think it's important to remember that i bring you know caste and education privilege i i'll just quickly at, uh i i know shantali and tara asked me about building a queer kinship and you know i have had di- different experiences i you know we have have we have tried to have intentional queer um well intentional community of artists and activists that we lived together um and um and shamtali knows some of our friends and it was very difficult times it was right after 911 in new york city uh some of us were undocumented dealing with mental health and illness and we struggled and we tried to provide as much as possible to these limitations and then there was a radical like breakdown you know like and a meltdown in that commune and you know friends didn't talk with each other for a very long time and i didn't um you know this friend in mind and uh we didn't communicate for years and years because there were some issues of accountability to each other and only like last december or this january i'm in colombo doing research and my friend was performing and we were seeing each other after 17 years you know and we couldn't i couldn't hold my tears back and you know while that experiment might have failed um i'm glad i've i made myself vulnerable that we tried and that i learned lessons of what it is to be to build these kinds of queer kins and what are the limits and joys of it you know um i i think i remain committed to that i cannot say i'm completely anti capitalist i do buy things i uh, i have to i live in the us and i have to think of certain ways of building security in my life but we can i think there are ways we can sort of create heterotopias where we can sort of invert these things where we can share with each other i think sujan um you know the, your question is both deeply complicated um and incredibly simple um and i'm going to just answer the incredibly simple part for a second um the same as why a lot of queer people think they can't be homophobic it's very it's it's very similar we are brought up and trained in exactly the same ways as our neighbors our aunts and uncles our cousins you know whoever we are being fed the same things we have the same representation and if it takes so much work for those of us who have the space and luxury to self reflect and undo then just imagine what it would take for all of those people who never even had the space to begin that work and therefore remained in that in where they are and then you know perpetrate the same thing it become it we we undo those things in ourselves because somewhere we see ourselves in that cycle but not everybody even has the space to step out to see that in within themselves and i think that's a big part of um so we must you know because also because uh, they were also saying you know that and and i think meda that we all, we have to hold them accountable but we also want to hold them because we see um because we see that they did not have that space but i think both are equally important to understand and do and i think to sort of add to to that is just like the like the immense difficulty with which this an intention it takes to like get rid of these things is I'm probably like my mother was someone who is like said no to all the things that like in patriarchy and then like per- like raised me very like staunchly like anti-capitalist anti-patriarchy from when I was tiny I don't remember a time like I wasn't so I and yet I still have so it takes like I'm one generation removed from that and it's still so strong um and I think that sort of kind of what uh with what Devanuj was saying like I've been doing lots of work um living on farms that are commune 
like or communally run and mostly queer um and i think that a lot of that is sort of the problems of doing that in the united states are mostly like it's all white queers and they all are crazy and then i have to leave because they're white queers and they don't understand and they like <laughs> they treat my mom like the help um so it's like it very there's so much going into like having to live with people and grow with people that like you know the sort of onto the question of queer kinship that someone um posed queer kinship communities like it's not that easy it takes a lot everybody involved has to be examining themselves and like taking apart how they have been raised and intentionally coming together with love and um sometimes people try to do that and it doesn't work and sometimes it does and you just have to try and try and try and it's really tiring so for me, as somebody who's slightly elder, one of the things that I found with kinship and community is that providing a space as somebody who has privilege to do so is really important when you can do that. And uh, we've held a couple different retreats at my home personally for younger queer uh, South Asian and Desi kind of kids. And it's been a really amazing experience. Uh, I think twice now since 2018, where we've had somewhere between 15 to 20 people at the house uh, providing meals. And, you know, one, one year it was during Ramzan, so people got to have fast and uh, breaking things like, you know, that uh, together. So uh, the, those of us that are elder that might have the capacity, might have privilege uh, socioeconomically or being able to provide those meals or food or a home and giving back to our younger kind of queers has been a space that I'm trying to kind of hold for people. Um, it's organically happened from a couple different conferences that I've been at where we found little contingents of South Asians or Desi people are here or there. And then all of a sudden we start a WhatsApp group or a chat. And then all of a sudden everybody's at the house one year. So. <laughs> you know, I think of when I was doing research on housing in, in, in New York, I think of a Punjabi auntie who once told me, I asked her how many bedrooms are here and how many people live here. And she said, oh, there's eight of us and there's one bedroom. And so I said, there was a question about overcrowding. And I said, is this overcrowding? And she said, Bas dil be jaga honi chahi, beta. so, you know, it was like very sweet. Uh, you know, it came with and it reminds me of like what it means to kind of struggle with limited space and also like like in, in, in Bangladesh, in India, in Nepal, you know, I think trans communities, Koti, Hijra, Durani communities live in queer kinships, you know, especially now given what is happening with COVID-19, you know, none of them, many of them have lost work, you know, and I see every day my friends, you know, raising money, you know, distributing, you know, chal, dawal, you know, uh, alu, as simple as that. Um, and, and that is an example of communities of, of shared favor, you know, what I call, you know, we live here in, a, you know, we are asked to survive in neoliberal economies of abandonment. And I think there are communities of care in these sites of abandonment. So we don't have to just turn to, you know, the white model of intentional communities. There are models within our communities of how they're surviving. Plus, yeah, and, and it's also to just add to that, that there's also these kinships are could also be imagined. Sometimes they allow us even to imagine it, these imagined communities to survive because knowing uh, even creating kinships on uh, online on the platforms have allowed so many queers to actually uh, fight um, those forces of hatred in the community and, and live on um, as, as a queer person living um, in Afghanistan and also Pakistan, those imagined communities and knowing that they were out there, but they were also online uh, allowed me to process that, to to be hopeful that there is going to be a time that we all meet, uh, that we can create this community. But also one other thing that I wanted to point out that we also, in, in, in um, discussion of kinship, to be also mindful that we don't um, romanticize the queer kinship, because at times queer kinship could also be spaces of violence and spaces of um, hatred, classism, casteism, uh, um, and, and, and just similar violences that we experience outside the queer uh, kinship. Because 
uh, we are all so hurt and pained uh, outside this kinship that when we, uh, whenever we enter these spaces, we come with those scars, we come with those wounds, and then we haven't healed. So the healing itself is a, a long process. And within that, we happen to also hurt those who are around us who also happen to be queer. So um, to just be mindful of that, that sometimes we think that the queer kinships are so safe, but it's sometimes it's not. Um, I just sort of was looking in the questions and um, someone, Dara, um, asked a question about caste not being um, fully, uh, you know, caste not being around in non-Hindu majority countries in South Asia. And I think that that is kind of a naive assumption, not naive necessarily, but like the, that idea isn't necessarily true. It may not go by the name of caste, but caste probably caused a lot of divides that are seen economically, like you said, um, because while yes, there's no caste in Islam, there is caste in South Asia and it has moved. And part of like when we were in Pakistan, it was like, well, if you like that's you can't say that there's caste in Pakistan because that would be saying that there's stuff that is Islam in Pakistan. And it's like, well, no, there is caste, but it doesn't get talked about or dealt with at all um, in the same ways. And so it creates a very complicated sort of thing. And I think like class is a pretty com like comparable um, thing. And yes, and there's also Hindus in all South Asian countries as science. And, so I think it's a lot more complicated than caste not existing. Um, yeah. There is caste and classism in, in Muslim society too, though, in a sense, right? Like Sunnis are against uh, Shia, Shias are against, uh, you know, Ismailis. I mean, it, when you still look at the divisions within Islamic culture and how people treat one another, and then um, there's casteism in the sense that there's like socioeconomic, like what your family does, who does what, whose family has uh, this much, where they live, and and, you know, from the economic perspective of it, uh, there's still levels of, of, you know, divide within the community. Yeah, thanks, Tara, for the question. I think also, uh, Tara, you bring up something important is to think about exactly what Firoza, Mubina, and Medha is helping us to do is to think about caste from a non-Indian lens, right? Um, so, you know, in my work, and, and, and I, I responded to Tara about like how I see caste playing out, especially in the context of India and Bangladesh, like uh, Bengalis in Bangladesh would like, in India would like to think there is no caste problem among us, right? But the problem is that precisely after 1947 and 1971, the way resettlement happened, it's based on caste like which caste got to stay, which caste actually had the privilege to like move, um, which caste of Hindus got to move to, you know, Calcutta proper, which caste of people, uh, of Hindus got to live in like Sundarbans, uh, who, what caste of Hindus are in Bangladesh, right? And then also the histories of conversion, as, as many of you have mentioned, you know, who was converted, who got to convert, and like, you know, why are, uh, sort of a specific kind. I remember like being in, in Kolkata in a, in a missionary school and I was telling my best friend who's come, who, who's Catholic, uh, oh, why don't you sit next? I like this boy. We can also, I was so gay. I like this boy. All three of us should sit in the same bench. And he said, no, I am, I'm a better Christian because I'm like a, I'm a, you know, I'm a Tambram Christian. And I came home and I asked my parents, do Christians, Christians have, you know, Brahminism. And, you know, so there are longer histories through which we have to think about caste, that caste persists within us, right? And, but yes, Tara, I mean, I think there are different ways to do it. My question though is, is loving across caste boundaries, is loving across religious boundaries in itself a radical act, you know? Um, I feel you know, in my lover's touch, I'm undone in, in, in some sense, you know, but that doesn't mean when we leave the bed or the room, the material divisions among us are gone, right? Uh, but that's just a broader question. 
you know, like what, what is radical love and desire? I often want to think about it and like, you know. Just add to what um, Cheyenne was asking earlier about also uh, Firoza added within the Muslim community is the caste. It's also in the larger context, if you look at it, there's also the Arabs and Ajam within the larger context of Muslims with that Arabs are so-called considered to be the chosen and then Ajam, which means the Ajnabi, the outsider. And so within that, there's a creation of these level, different levels of classism that comes in. But then within these other communities, you'll see the, the Berber and the Arabs. And within Afghanistan, there is these ethnic groups that have created those hierarchies of uh, power. The, the Hazaras are constantly being uh, oppressed by the majority Pashtun and Tajiks. And those are coming across also these ideas of caste across different um, region in, in South Asia is influencing each other in different ways. And, and that's so prominent, especially these days, because the interactions between these borders are um, so f in many ways so flu uh, problematic, pro politicized, but also um, in some ways um, fluid, because there are people moving around and bringing those ideas cast and also learning from each other. And those violences also travel across different borders between Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. Aji bijan ra te, aji nishit ra te, aash pe jo di shunno ha te, aami tai te ki bhoi mani jani, jani bandhu jani. I totally butchered this Robin Rashongir, but it's one of my favorite where, and it's picturized beautifully in this movie made by a, a butch queer filmmaker. Um, and, you know, the song basically says, in this dark night, in the corner of my house, when you came to me, um, and I reached out with my hand and I gave everything. Um, and I know that your hands will always be outstretched, dear friend. So I always go back to the figure of the friend because friendships, friends ask us to be ethical. Friends challenge us. Friends can leave us. They can walk away. Our partners might not. You know, they're kind of with the nature of romantic partnership. They're kind of bound to, are we bound to kind of at least try to work it out. Um, and so I find this song, for me, that is my idea of like radical love is where, um, where we walk with each other and then we part when we need to part. And then there is another friend that appears maybe and it's that it's that reaching out the outstretching like Firoza said is to is to think where i can step in and and give something and where i can go back and i don't have to do something i think on that beautiful note we can wrap this uh, it has been uh on, on that note beautiful song that Devanuj shared with us of the love of friends that they have um, hold us accountable for um, in many ways but also has hold us in love um, if you do you have any other last thoughts to share Mubina if you have any other things in mind for us to do I don't know. There is a question. Uh, there are two questions. One, one is yeah answered, but there is one question there. If, so it's on caste, class, and South Asian communities itself. Is the is the problem partly also because these issues become moralities through religion? Would you say that in many ways our moralities have been colonized and 
taken on an even more vicious form in the current climate? The, yeah, this is the question here. Someone wants to go and answer. For, for me, morality is like very twisted uh, way to, you know, curb and control uh, people <laughs> and their ways of loving. So, uh, yeah, that, that definitely puts us uh, under, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, under modesty and morality, you, you can't do this and you can't do that. But yeah, I, I would say that's a very twisted thing. And uh, through religion, definitely it, it, it becomes way more oppressive in South Asian communities. Then in current climate, because of the rise of far right, the polarization is so extreme that like I remember growing up in my community, nobody was wearing burqa or naqab or anything. And now they all want to wear because of this far right ideology that they are pushing them into, you know, the identity existential, uh, you know, uh, idea of like, okay, if we are not not Hindu, we are not supporting Hinduism or not Hinduism, but exactly Hindutva, then we are Muslim and we have to wear, we have to look like a Muslim, like as with me also, it happens every time. Uh, just yesterday, I was just taking a walk with my kid and uh, this guy with a beard, he was asking me like, hi, how are you? And then he was using very Americanized accent. And then he was like, my name is Ali. And then I was like, yeah, Ali, right? And then he was like, okay, and what's your name? And I was like, Mubina Qureshi. And he was like, Assalamu Alaikum, are you Muslim? And I was like, ah, yes. So those moralities and, you know, stereotyping and all this in current climate is really, really going in extreme ends. And that is really, you know, that, that, that makes me feel so bad and fearful because experiencing 2002 riots in Gujarat, coming out from that mentality that saying I'm a Muslim can cause some harm to me. At the same time, not calling myself a Muslim also is, you know, moral aspect. My, my families and my friends would, you know, go against my answer. So the, the complexity with moralities and religion, I think, is just there in South Asian communities. And that forces us to, you know, fix into somewhere, somehow. And that, that, that's where I find uh, queerness. The fluidity is necessary for people like us to just, you know, go and flow with the uh, flow and understand all these uh, complex strings. Anybody else wants to like? So, hey, but I have to jump off because I have a department meeting to go to. Uh, but thank you so much. I am I'm full of love and I hope we I'm, I look forward to the recording and continuing the conversation. And um, Anahita and Medha, uh, uh, guys, all of you, if I can if I can get your creative work in certain way, I would love to teach, read, write, cite you all. Thank you, thank you, Firoza. Thank you. So much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. So just to add to what um, to that question of morality, I think morality is yeah has been impacted by religion in many ways, but it's also for many people, especially in the diaspora, it's also being impacted by surveillance of the state by on, on, on Muslim bodies and, and Muslim um, families and, 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 and the also uh, to extend that on immigrants and undocumented people. So uh, on queer bodies, on trans bodies. So morality is, 
shifting and changing whenever it comes to in contact with all those forces of colonizers, whether it's at home or in the diaspora. And we all exist within those forces and negotiate what, what sort of moralities to take on, what sort of moralities are being challenged, whether it is about decolonizing love. These are efforts that we put because um, we want a liberation from within ourselves because we have that sense of imprisonment, whether it's through our um, love for ourselves or the community or the kinships we face. So all those moralities are constantly being challenged and also police because we live in, in a place that the state has constant surveillance on us. I'm Muslim and I'm showing my boobs. <laughs> it's just, I mean, you know, it is, it's very uh, intertwined, you know, your morality, your religion, um, culture, all of it. And, uh, you know, it's been a real big struggle for me to find where I feel comfortable in that, um, in, in those areas. Uh, until about two years ago, roughly when I came out, I was expected as a trans woman who has passing privilege to live within that privilege and not really speak about being TGNC. So it was understood within my family that my nieces and nephews would not really know about this until they were adults, that we weren't going to talk about it. And because I had passing privilege, you know, uh, I was always, uh, based on the experiences I had in violence and other things like that, uh, afraid to live out as an open kind of trans woman. But uh, the last two years have needless uh, to say been very, very interesting within my family, the conversations, uh, kids finding out and everything else. Um, I really just don't care anymore, <laughs> to be quite honest, what anybody thinks about me or what I wear or how much I show or what I do. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this, um, you know, Anahita mentioned, you know, that loving yourself in where you're at is enough. And, and that's where I'm at now. It's just, I love who I am, where I'm at, where my body is at, uh, in my age group and all the, you know, ableist or, you know, fat phobic and, and everything else. I just, I absolutely love where I'm at in my being and uh, push that out. So fuck morality. I think yeah, we have covered all the questions. Yay, so we wanna wrap Mobina? Yep. What's up? Yep. Okay, because everybody has probably other yeah. plans. Yeah. It's Friday. <laughs> Absolutely. It's already yes. four. Yeah. Yeah. So you can all unmute yourself. Let's say our last loving words and goodbyes. It was such a beautiful Thank you. pleasure seeing Love you. Love you all. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here, and we will continue these conversations some way, some way, Absolutely. hopefully in person, when all of this is over. I hope so. Yes. You guys can always come to my house. We can do a retreat. I have been looking at your cooking shows every day, so yes, I want to come. <laughs> <laughs>